you know, Joshua was getting ready to, to pass away. He was getting ready to go on and, and he was challenging the children of Israel. Here's what you're gonna do in my absence. Here's what you do next. And so we looked at his farewell address for probably, I don't know, six to seven weeks. And, and I don't know about you, but that Joshua chapter 24 really, really impacted me, impacted my home. And I'm thankful that God's word is still alive. And so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna begin another probably five weeks. This is gonna get us all the way to rally weekend. And, and God really changed gears on, on where we were headed. I was praying this week and this one really, um, I wish I could say I was this smart that I would plan out this way, but I'm not. And so the spirit of God spoke to me on Monday and completely changed the direction that I thought we were going. And so as we've, we've unpacked Joshua's farewell letter, um, this week we're gonna start journeying through and, and unpacking, for lack of a better word, Jesus's farewell letter to his disciples. We're gonna talk about the last conversations that he, that he had with his disciples. And we're gonna look at the conversation. We're gonna look at some of the events um, that took place. But just so that I can catch you up where we're at and where we're gonna start today is, is that Jesus is just coming to the end of his public ministry. He's spent the last three years walking with his disciples, doing ministry. He's been, he's been teaching. He's been healing. He's been loving people. He's been offering the gift of salvation for those who will deny themselves and follow him. And, and so in John chapter 12, we see that, that Jesus addresses the public for the very last time in his earthly ministry. And as we've all read this before, I never really sat on the weight of the fact that this was Jesus's last conversation to the public. But in John chapter 12, we read that in verses 35 and, and 37, it says, so Jesus said to them, this is the public, this is the masses, for a little while longer, the light is among you. Walk while you have the light so that the darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become sons of the light. Then listen to this, the weight of this verse. These things Jesus spoke and he went away and he hid himself from them. And so as far as we know, this is one of Jesus' last invitations for people to follow him, for people to trust in him as the light. And so I usually try to start every Sunday morning kind of lighthearted, but this morning I'm gonna sort of have to come out swinging. And what I mean by that is if you ever thought about what if today is your day that you will hear the invitation to follow Christ for the last time? What if today is the last opportunity that you have to respond to the gospel, to respond to the good news? Or maybe in your mind, you're thinking, well, I can do that tomorrow, or I can do that Monday, or I can do that Wednesday, or Friday, or, or whatever day, but just not today. The heartbreaking news, as we shared last week, and I know we don't like to talk about this a lot anymore, but 10 out of 10 people in this room are gonna die. We don't know if that's gonna be today, or we don't know if that's gonna be 50 years from now. But the one thing we do know is Jesus is gonna extend the invitation for you to follow him. But what if today's the last day? What if today is the last opportunity for you to respond? Because as we looked at, we all live in this short window of life. We all live in this short window of life that the Bible even references as a vapor. And so what if today is that last day? What if today is your last opportunity to respond? Because that was what was taking place in John chapter 12. Is he saying, hey, while the light's with you, follow me. But now Jesus' public ministry is coming to an end. And in John chapter 13, his ministry goes from public to some would say it's gone to private now. Because what we're seeing at this point is he's gathering all of the disciples together in the upper room for what we know as the Last Supper. And he's gonna do the very same thing that Joshua did to the children of Israel. He's going to instruct them with the what now. I'm about to go home. 
My earthly ministry is about to come to a close in my flesh, but here's what I want you to do in my absence. And so he's gathering the disciples together, and, and we're going to look at that today. We're going to start in chapter 13, verse 1, and this is where they're sitting around at the table, and they're getting ready to hear the last words from Jesus before he journeys into to offering up his life for a sacrifice. Listen to what he says in John chapter 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, and having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He loved them to the end. Now, something that people would say that Jesus is kind of at an unfair advantage to here because while he's 100% God, he's still 100% man. And so we read in the scripture, according to what John wrote, that Jesus knew that his hour had come. He knew that his earthly ministry was over and he knew that he was about to suffer death on the cross. He knew that all that is what he was about to face. And so in light of knowing that, in light of knowing that he's about to depart from this world, he leaves them with some very, very heavy instruction. And at the same time, he, he's gonna exemplify what these instructions should look like. And so here again, we're set with a, the mindset to contemplate something, to think about something. Yes, Jesus knew this was his last night and we, we see what Jesus did. He addressed the disciples with specific instructions. And we're gonna look at it in a minute, but he said he loved them to the end. So he knew that approaching the last hours of his life, he knew how weighty those last few moments were. And so as I contemplated that, I had to examine my own life. What if for me that I knew that this is the last time that I stand to preach the gospel? What if tonight is the last night that I get to sit with my family in my living room? What if tomorrow morning's the last morning that I get to to go to my workplace? What if tomorrow is your last day to go to your workplace? What if tonight is the last night that you spend at home with your family? Would it influence how you spend these last moments? Would it influence what you do or what you thought or, or where you would go? Because, you know, the first thing that we may do is reference that bucket list. I got my bucket list, so I'm gonna see. I gotta check box one, two, and three. Here's what I'm gonna spend the next 24 hours doing. Would you check the bucket list? Would you check off number one, number two, number three? Or if this was your last day, would you simply go and hug someone? Or would you simply go and thank someone for loving you? If you knew this was your last day, would you go and resolve a conflict that you've got with a former friend or or former family member? Would you go and make things right? Or if this was your last day, is there that one individual that God's placed on your heart that you know doesn't know Jesus? And you said, if this is it, I gotta go tell him. And as I begin to think about that, I. I realized that my day-to-day activities would look a lot different in my own life if I lived a life of urgency in this manner to think about the fact of my hour has come. This is it. How would you spend the last hours of your life? And I would venture to say this. I believe that this so confused, disgusting world that we live in would look a lot different if the believer would live with that mindset and that urgency. I believe everything that we face would look a lot different if the church would live with this type urgency that Jesus is exemplifying right here. And so I want us to look and see and see what Jesus' life of urgency looked like in this last supper with his disciples. So he sat at the table and the Bible says that he, he loved them to the end. He loved them to the end. You know, as sad as it is, that word love is something that we've just watered down. 
Do we really even know what love means anymore? Because what we realize is there's a very sharp contrast from the world's definition of love to the biblical definition of love. John MacArthur defines love as this. The world's version of love is unbashedly narcissistic, totally self-focused, and shamelessly manipulative. It seems merely as a means of self-gratification. That's how the world defines love. And, and so I always like to put things to the test. And so what I did in my mind is I sat and I thought, okay, I'm gonna fill in the blank. I'm gonna think about some things that, that I love. And so what I wanna ask you to do is the very same thing. If we were to have, I love blank. I want you to fill in that blank. I love, is it a hobby? Is it a particular place? Is it a person? Is it a sports team? I hope it's not the Atlanta Falcons. <laughs> or is it a food? Because we attach the word love to all of those things that I've, I've just mentioned. And so as you fill in the blank of I love blank, now I want you to ask yourself another question. And that question is simply, why? Why do I love that place? Why do I love that food? Why do I love that person? Why do I love that sports team? And the humbling part for me is I unpacked all of that and I realized why Brian says I love blank is because a lot of times it's always pointing back to self-gratification as to how those things make me feel. Even a person. We love somebody because they make us feel good about ourselves, right? And so what we realize is that the world's definition of love is contrary to what the biblical definition of love is. The biblical definition of love, we always read the definition of love at, at every wedding that we ever do. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul unpacks what love is. Love is patient, love is kind, it's long-suffering, it is not jealous, it does not boast. We know all though that. It's always about something else. And what we see is that's not at all what the world teaches about love. But when we really get down to the bottom line, true love is when our interest or concern is focused in the opposite direction of us. That's what true love looks like. That's how true love is exercised. That it's when we turn our back on our own interest and we begin to show total interest in others. We turn it in the opposite direction of us. One scholar wrote this, the essence of love is self-sacrifice. Instead of tearing down, you build up. Instead of pursuing your own interest, it pursues the interest of others. Instead of having needs met, it seeks to meet the needs of others. That's what love biblically looks like. And that's exactly what Jesus is telling them in, in chapter 13, verse 15. He says, I've shown you this. I've talked to you about this. I've left this example. He says in verse 15, for I gave you an example that you should also do as I did to you. Can we ever look back at a time in scripture where Jesus's love would have been defined with his best interest in mind? Nowhere in scripture would Jesus have exemplified love by being focused on him. He always expressed love by focusing on a lost world. And so I want us to look at, at an activity, if you would, or an act of love that Jesus exemplifies in verses two through five. Read with me in verses two through five. It says, during supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Verse three, Jesus knowing that the father had given all things into his hands and he had come forth from God and he was about to go back to God. He got up 
from supper. And he laid aside his garments and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them the towel with which he was girded. Now, we have to get a visual of what this room actually looked like because we've all seen the pictures of the, the Last Supper, right? Right? You've all seen the pictures and the paintings of, of where there's this straight table and all the disciples with Jesus right in the middle. They're all just sitting there at a very high top table. They've all got smiles on their faces and it looks like they have the world's longest selfie stick and they took that picture of themselves and there they all are. That's not at all what scholars believe this room looked like. The table of the Last Supper would have been a, a somewhat U-shaped table very, very low to the ground, and in each spot where the disciples and Jesus would sit, there would, there would be a pillow or there would be a, a cloth. I always think about a dog's bed. Y'all know what? And I don't have any idea if that's what it looked like, but in my mind, that's what it would look like. But what the disciples would do with Jesus is, you've heard in the scripture, they talk about they were reclining at the table. It is literally that. They were reclining at the table. And so there's only one way to explain this, and I'm gonna get on the floor and show you. If this was the table, they would literally be laying on their side with their left elbow on the floor, eating with their right hand. And so therefore, if I'm Jesus, I'm not at all. So let's just say I'm Peter. That's what, that sounds even better. <laughs> Another disciple would have been right here. So now you're about to see the importance of clean feet, right? Because you can you imagine? I would hate to know I was sitting beside my son eating this way. It would be horrible. <laughs> But they would be reclining all around the table, laying on the ground. And so everybody, nobody standing up, nobody standing out. They're all reclining at the table with one another. And, and it was customary, as we, we made a joke about the feet, is, is when they would enter to the room or enter into this building or the home of anybody that you were about to have dinner with, there would have been someone at the door. In most cases, it would have been a Gentile slave or a Gentile servant who then would have have washed the Jews' feet. They would have washed their feet. They would have cleaned them with the water, with the towel, with the rag. And then they would have proceeded on to have a seat and recline at the table for dinner. And so here they all are. They're reclining at the table, this last supper. And then all of a sudden, the Messiah, Jesus, the Savior of the world, stands up. He walks over to the door and he, he takes off his outer garment. And then according to the scripture, he picks up the towel. He picks up the cloth and he wraps it around his waist. And in that moment, the disciples would have taken note as to something's about to go down. Because you see, when he puts this thing around his waist, this would have been the uniform of a servant. This would have been the kind of the name tag at the Waffle House. Like you would have known, okay, they're here to work. That's what they do. That's why they're here. They're here to serve. They're here to take care. And that's exactly what this uniform that Jesus would have placed around his waist would have symbolized to these disciples. And there's a lot of scholars that in their conversation with this, they, some of them are led to believe that when Jesus got up from the table, that there's potentially the, the reasoning that he was, he was frustrated. Because remember, as we said, it would have been customary that when they came into the room, that there would have been someone to clean their feet. There would have been someone there to wash their feet. And because there was no one there to serve them, according to what the Bible says, they came right on in and they took a place at the table. And so because there wasn't someone there to wash their feet, because there wasn't someone there to serve them, they, they just didn't worry about it. They came on in and they had a, had a seat. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we see that the whole environment of the room changed. And one of the reasons that scholars believe that Jesus could have been frustrated is because some of the conversation that was going on among the disciples so instead of serving each other, instead of saying, hey, Peter, let me, let me wash your feet for you. Instead of doing all that, according to Luke chapter 22, 
They were actually arguing about something that was the exact opposite of washing feet. Luke chapter 22, verse 24, and there arose a dispute among them. Listen, as to which one of them was regarded to be the greatest. So instead of serving each other, they're arguing about who is the greatest disciple. So can you imagine as Jesus has led them, as he's loved them, as he's poured their heart out to them, now all of a sudden they're not at all reproducing what Jesus has exemplified for them. And so for that reason alone, scholars believe that that in frustration, Jesus would have got up. And this is a whole nother message for another day, but have you ever noticed that every time in scripture that Jesus gets up, something changes? Every time Jesus gets up, something changes. And so he gets up, puts on his uniform, and he approaches Peter. Look in verses six through eight. So he, Jesus, he came to Simon Peter, and he said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? This is Peter looking at Jesus saying, are you about to wash my feet? Then he goes on to say, Jesus answered him, what I do, you don't realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Then in verse eight, and we're gonna stop halfway through verse eight. And Peter said to him, never shall you wash my feet. And so we see that there's some friction in this conversation that that Jesus is wanting to serve Peter. He's wanting to love Peter. And Jesus and Peter says, are you about to wash my feet? And then Jesus basically says, yes. And Peter turns it up a notch. Never will you wash my feet. And so in this aggressive mindset and in this way of thinking, we see that, that Jesus and Peter They had a relationship because Peter would have understood who Jesus is. The reason that Peter was coming at Jesus is because in Peter's mind, there is no way that the Messiah, there's no way that the Savior of the world is gonna stoop to wash my feet. I'm not worthy for the Messiah to wash my feet. I'm not worthy for the Savior of the world to put water on these old disgusting things and wash them and wipe them down. And so we see that Peter would have understood who Jesus was. And there's no way in this moment that he was willing to let him, to let him do it. But we see that Jesus says, Peter, it's obvious that you don't understand what I'm about to do. It's obvious, Peter, that you don't fully get it yet. You didn't wash anybody's feet when y'all came in, so you obviously, it hasn't clicked yet. And so instead of just talking about it, I'm gonna keep living it out. And I'm gonna love you till the very, very end. I'm gonna serve you till the very, very end. Because we've seen all through the scripture where Jesus has addressed what serving and loving people looks like. You don't have to turn there, but in in Matthew chapter 20, I'm gonna have these on the screen. Matthew chapter 20, verses 26 through 28. This is Jesus talking here. He said, it's not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. Then in Matthew 23, or 20, and then it says, and whoever wishes to be the first among you shall be your slave. Just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Then in Matthew 23, we see something very similar. Jesus is still teaching on it. But the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled. And whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. He's saying, Peter, I've already taught you all of this. I've already taught you what it means to be the greatest in the kingdom. And what that looks like is for you to love, for you to serve. It's not about you exalting yourself, but it's about you taking care of others. And so as we kind of try to put a bow on this 
this mindset of what does biblical love look like? The next time you tell somebody you love them, and husbands, I really want you to think about this because I've had to all week. When you tell your wife you love her, you realize what you're ultimately saying to her is your needs are more important than mine. What if that was the mindset in our homes? That when we tell each other we love you, if we're loving them biblically, we're saying, hey, I'm at your service. Your needs are more important than mine. Now I'm gonna get text all week and say, my husband ain't told me he loved me all week now. <laughs> Thanks, preacher. But when we tell somebody we love them, it's exactly what Jesus was doing. He's saying, you are more important to me than I am. Your needs are more important than mine. And he's exemplified this in washing their feet. I'm gonna humble myself. I'm gonna stoop to the level that only a, a Gentile slave should do, but I'm, I'm gonna take on the form of a servant and I'm gonna do the lowest of lows and I'm gonna wash those nasty things because you're more important than I am. And that's what true love looks like. And so we've seen that Jesus has lived out this, this example or what we would probably say this, this practical side of love, that loving is simply serving. But now he shifts gears in his conversation with Peter and he goes from the practical side of living out love to, to showing him what the spiritual side of love looks like. And ultimately the main reason that Jesus was sent and this has been my prayer. I, I pray that somebody here today, I'm just gonna throw this out there. My prayer has been all week that somebody is saved today as a result of what we're about to read and what we're about to understand. Or maybe you've been saved and you're wrestling with, well, I can't truly be saved if I'm still doing this or I'm still doing that. I'm praying that the spirit of God is gonna settle your heart today. And that you can leave here with confidence in the finished work of what Christ has done. And that's the spiritual lesson that, that Jesus is gonna unpack with Peter. Look in verse eight, finished verse eight. He goes, we'll go back to the start of verse eight. He says, Peter said to him, never shall you wash my feet. Listen to Jesus's answer. If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. You notice that Jesus uses the phrase there, wash you. He doesn't mention feet. He doesn't mention getting between the toes. He doesn't mention a pedicure. But Jesus says, I've got to wash you. And so spiritually, what Jesus is speaking to into the life of Peter, he's saying, Peter, if you don't allow me to cleanse you of your sin, then you will have no part with me. If you don't place your faith in me to forgive you of your sins, then, then you'll have no place with me. You'll have no relationship with me. So spiritually speaking here, when he's talking about a washing, he's talking about a full cleansing. From the soles of his feet to the top of his head, he's saying, hey, you've got to let me wash you clean. He's ultimately saying, Peter, you can't clean up enough to have a relationship with me. Peter, you can't be good enough to have a relationship with me. You've simply got to trust in the finished work that I've been sent to accomplish. And that work is to wash you clean and to make you new. It's my job. It's my job to cleanse you, to make you clean. But I wonder how many of us wrestle, maybe even with what potentially Peter's wrestling with. Oh, whew. I've got to clean up. 
How do I be good enough to earn God's love? There's no way that God can love me because of of my sin. There's no way that God can love me because of my thoughts. There's no way that that God can love me because of who I am. There's no way that God can love me because of what I've done to my family. And we constantly live in this battle of, of performance, trying to earn God's love when Jesus is telling Peter here, no, Peter, if you don't let me make you clean, you'll have no part with me. And so for us, what we have to understand is what Jesus is spiritually speaking to us is we've sung about the blood already. We're gonna sing about the blood in just a moment. We've gotta realize the blood being poured out is the only thing that can wash away our sin. And aren't you thankful that the blood never loses its power? It ain't power, it's power. (laughs) Ain't it? Ain't it? Y'all see that? That's what the blood is for. That's what the blood was poured out for, was to do what we couldn't do for ourselves and to cleanse us and to make us whiter than snow. And Jesus did that. And he loved us to the very end. And so Jesus quickly corrects Peter. He says, Peter, listen, if you don't let me wash you, you'll have no place with me. Look how quickly Peter changes gears. Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands, my head, probably my armpits, everywhere. Wash me, do whatever you have to do because I wanna know that I am your child. I wanna know that I am a child of God. I wanna know this. So Jesus, you do whatever you have to do to me to cleanse me, to make me new. And it's almost as if panic sets in for Peter. Do whatever you gotta do. Because I want to be a part of you. I want to have a relationship with you. I want that. So so Jesus, do whatever you have to do. And so even in Peter's panic and Peter's chaos, in verse 10, I believe with everything in me that these are probably the most soothing words that Peter has ever heard from the Savior's mouth. Verse 10 Jesus said to him, he who has bathed, notice the past tense, bathed, needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And some of you need to highlight, you need to underline the next statement out of Jesus' mouth. And you are clean. And you are clean. So can you imagine in Peter's chaos right there in that moment, would Jesus do whatever he got to do? And to hear the son of God, look at that child and say, hey, don't panic. You're clean. You're clean. He's saying, Peter, chill out. Calm down, Peter. You're clean. And so Jesus is speaking directly to Peter's salvation. And we know that because of the word choice that Jesus uses. If we notice, I I emphasize, it says that he who has bathed is past tense and needs only to wash present tense his feet. So you think in your mind, well, what's the difference here that that bathed and washed? Here's the most comforting thing for us in the English language. The comparison in the original language between bathe and wash is the same contrast that we too would would visualize when it comes to our English language. And what I mean by that is I think about our children. I think about kids when they come in from outside. If they played outside yesterday, they came in nasty. They came in disgusting 
from head to toe, covered in nastiness, mud, probably grass, everything else. And you're surely, as a parent, you're gonna tell your child, hey, you know what? You need to go get in the what? Bath. You need to go be fully bathed. You need to be go fully to wash your, you need to get clean because you're disgusting, right? Do y'all say that to y'all's kids? Okay, good, because I do all the time. But then maybe our kids just ran through the front yard and they come in and their feet are dirty and they just say, hey, what would we say? Hey, go wash your hands, go wash your feet, go wash up. And we see that there's a very, very big difference in a bath and washing. And so what Jesus wants Peter to understand, there's a very good reason that he says, Peter, those of you who have been bathed, it means that Peter, quit worrying about it. You've already been cleansed by my blood. You've already been cleansed by my work. So therefore, you've been bathed. You've been washed clean. You've been made new because you have followed me. So don't worry about the cleansing. Don't worry about being bathed. I've already took care of that. I've already taken care. That's past tense. Because I believe with everything in me that salvation of Jesus Christ is a no-so salvation. And there's some people here today that because of your sin, it's almost fogged up the fact that you've been bathed, that you've been cleansed, that Jesus has told you at some time in your life, you are clean. You are clean And so because of your sin, you've gone back and forth and you've doubted your salvation. But I love the fact that Jesus addresses that. He says those who have been bathed need only to wash his feet. What Jesus is spiritually speaking of is something that we as as a child of God, as followers of Christ, are gonna have to participate in every day in that simply daily repentance. It doesn't mean that you're getting saved again. It just simply means that I'm bringing my sin to the feet of Jesus and saying, because I am cleansed, because the Holy Spirit of God lives in me, you have shown me my sin. And God, I repent again today. I repent again today. And so there's somebody here today that you need to You need to think back on that day. That you heard the Spirit of God whisper to you. You are clean. You are clean. Do you remember when you felt the Spirit of God let you know that you were clean? I'm allowing you to sit on that for just a minute. Because the fact of the matter is what we're gonna go on to see that that Jesus addresses here is we get ready to close this out. He says there, right after he tells Peter, you are clean, what does he say at the end of verse 10? But not all of you. Then he goes on in verse 11, expands on that sum. For he knew the one who was betraying him. And for this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. So as we can think about Peter and and how as he hears the Messiah tell him, hey, Peter, stop panicking. You're clean. Can you imagine the overwhelming peace that Peter felt in that moment? Maybe today you've sat here and you've thought in that, figuratively speaking, that time in your life where you heard the Spirit of God whisper to you, my child, you're clean. And I would hope that it overwhelms you with emotions because 
That's true love that Jesus did for you in that moment, what you couldn't do for yourself. You couldn't fix this or you couldn't fix that and present yourself to God and say, okay, I'm clean. I'm righteous, I figured this out because we know that according to what the word of God says that our righteousness, just when we think we're good enough, compared to God is as filthy rags. But Jesus says, don't worry about that. If you will repent of your sins, you'll place your faith in me. You'll be made clean. You'll be made clean. But as Jesus is talking to the 12, he says, just the same as he's told Peter that he's clean. He said, but there's one of you at the table that's not. There's one of you at the table that's not. You know, the same holds true to this room. Even as we shared the last couple of weeks, at the end of the day, You've either been made clean by the blood of the lamb or you have not. Your sins have either been washed under the cleansing flood of the lamb or they have not. Have you placed your faith in what Jesus was sent to do? And if you have, my child, you're clean. You're clean. Or maybe you can honestly say, Brian, I don't, I don't know if I've been clean. So you're telling me that all I have to do is, is repent of my sins and turn from my ways and, and just say, God, I'm trusting in your plan. God, I'm asking you to do for me what I can't do for myself. So pastor, you're telling me that all I have to do is confess with my mouth and believe in my heart. You ready for the answer? Yes. And in that moment, you are clean. You know, and I know that if this sermon was being graded by some seminary professor today, then it would probably be a failing grade because we're not gonna go tie a bow back on this thing because you know, there's always, you gotta tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them, then go back and tell them what you told, all that stuff. We ain't messing with that. Because at the end of the day, I know this without a shadow of a doubt, there's somebody here today that needs to be made clean. And you've been prayed for this week, this morning, out there this morning. Don't be like Peter and say, okay, well, I'll do this or I gotta do this or I can. No, just trust in what Jesus has done. Call on his name this morning and just ask him to save you. And we're going to give you an opportunity to do that in just a minute. Or maybe you're a child of God today and you go back and you can remember, I can remember the peace when I heard the Son of God tell me that I was clean. But over time, I've drifted. Over time, I've fallen back into some of the very sins that I thought I'd whipped. You are clean. But just simply step back into fellowship. The reason that, that Christ wants this daily repentance, this washing, if you would, is to keep that relationship as pure as it possibly can be. And so maybe today as a child of God, 
You know you've been made clean by the blood of the lamb. But maybe you have fallen back into the trap of temptation and sin. Please know today that it doesn't change the fact that you've been made clean and bathed by the Son of God. Your sins have washed you whiter than snow. And so maybe as a child of God, you just need to to fall back on your face this morning. And you need to say, God, I know you've made me clean, but, but I've had sin crept up. And God, today I just need to come and I need you to just wash my feet. I need just to repent daily 